All right, Jesus Christ, the servant of humanity. Tonight we're going to look at the rich young ruler. Um, there is an interview with this young man. Now, this is a composite title when I say the rich young ruler. Uh, Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Luke's gospel each give us a different uh, aspect of this man. One, that he was young, the other, that he was rich, and the other, that he was a ruler. And so not from Mark's account would we learn that he is a, a Pharisee or ruler of the Jews, but with all of them together. Let's go ahead and begin reading in verse 17, and we'll go through verse 31. Mark chapter 10. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came unto him one running and kneeled uh, to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he uh, was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Uh, then we'll begin reading in verse 33, 23. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter uh, began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive a hundredfold now and this time houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. Don't let your material possessions keep you from having eternal life or a life of service for the Lord. So this particular situation here, or this scripture tonight, uh, is neatly joined together with our story on Forbid Not the Little Children, uh, where it takes the uh, childlike, humble faith of a, of a person to enter into a saving relationship with God. Perhaps this encouraged the rich young ruler uh, to come to the Lord Jesus, but by the time the interview is over, uh, this man will count himself out of the kingdom of God because he refuses to have the humble, childlike faith that is required to enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he has the right frame of mind, he's kept the law, uh, but he still feels that there's something lacking. He needs more in his life. Uh, Jesus loves him and calls him to become a disciple there and then. But sadly, uh, this man's uh, eagerness vanishes. And we find out that he has forfeited uh, an eternal treasure uh, with the Lord. Now, the purpose of this uh, section that we're reading tonight, verses 17 through 31, is to teach us that a good man's material uh, possessions and values can stand in the way of an eternal relationship and in the way of his service for the Lord. So our proposition, what we want you to learn from the message tonight is, is don't let your possessions uh, keep you from eternal life nor service. Let's look at all here, first of all, in verse 17, at the salutation of the rich man. Uh, it says here, and he kneeled to him and asked him, good master. But he's running up to him, uh, pleading with him uh, for an interview. 
So we see this in verse 17. Uh, Jesus was moving more towards Jerusalem, more towards the cross. And in the way comes this one young man who is running and kneels down before him, uh, eager, showing respect, uh, calling him good master. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so this is what the young man is after, is an assurance of how does one have eternal life? I trust tonight that before the message is finished, that you'll know that you do have eternal life and that you can have eternal life. You see, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God. So God wants you to know that you have eternal life. And so this is a good passage for us to discuss tonight. Are you 100% sure that you have a relationship with God that will lead to eternal life? Tonight, we'll discover how you can have that absolute confidence. Now, when we see uh, Jesus' response to this in verse 18, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Well, some have erroneously interpreted the statement of Jesus saying, no, I'm not a good person. You you shouldn't be calling me good. Uh, That's not what Jesus is doing. What Jesus is doing in this passage is trying to get this man to recognize that he is God. And the actual term here um, in verse 17, and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Uh, is out of place with one that would have knowledge that Jesus Christ is God or that Jesus Christ is someone that is actually superior uh, to one's self. So it is a, it's a term that equals or peers would use to ask one another a question or a favor. So this man, uh, in some sense, because he was young and rich, uh, maybe felt that he was equal standing socially with the Lord Jesus. Now he acknowledged that he was definitely a good teacher, uh, really uh, one that demanded respect. And uh, by the way that he approached him, we see that he has an admiration for the Lord Jesus as a religious teacher. But the Lord is trying to pull this man's attention a different direction. Um, Are you really acknowledging that I'm good? Because if you are, then you're acknowledging that I'm God. But if you're just saying, hey, I am an equal with you because you're a good teacher and I'm a good person, I'm rich, I have good social standing, then that's not sufficient. And so Jesus is trying to get this young man uh, to recognize his deity. And uh, he uses this commandment. uh, He's trying to use this commandment to help this young man realize his spiritual need so that he could be justified by faith and, as we'll see, not by his works. Had he recognized Jesus as God, his search for eternal life would have come to a conclusion on this night. So let's look for his search here in the second half of the verse. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What shall I do? Uh, His understanding of spiritual matters uh, was focused on his actions. You know, there are many people in our society today that believe that they have to do something to earn eternal life, that they have to do something to enter into the kingdom of God, that they have to do something to make God be pleased with them and to accept them. So this man had been steeped in the tradition of the rabbis uh, in a performance-based relationship, performance-based Christianity. Uh, There are many people who call themselves Christians who are trying to perform for God's favor. And this is nothing new. This is what the apostles in the New Testament show us over and over again, that it's not according to our own righteousness. It's not according to our own religious deeds, but rather according to the mercy and the grace of God. Now, this man's thinking is clear. He realizes man's greatest need is not a relationship with God just in this life, but for eternal life. And so he recognizes his need. So in a certain sense, this man has some religious education and knowledge that uh, brings him very close to eternal life, but yet so far away. Um, 
so he recognized that his observance of the Mosaic law and Jewish tradition, though um, he practiced it his whole life, that it was inadequate and that he needed something more. And so the Lord uh, asks him in his search uh, about his kind of life. Um, he says, Thou knowest the commandments, verse 19. Now, the commandments that Jesus quotes here in verse 19, these are the second half of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments emphasize one's relationship with the Heavenly Father. The um, second half of the Ten Commandments emphasize one's relationships with their fellow man. And so the Lord uh, asks about his relationship with his fellow men. So let's look at these commandments. Um, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that they're on their way to heaven because they keep the Ten Commandments. What we're going to find out here is the Lord says, no, that's not right thinking. Um, because you can keep them, but you still would not have eternal life. So this man had never violated a marriage vow if he was married. Um, he hadn't broken this commandment. Uh, how often is that commandment in our culture broken? Now, People fall into sin and are overcome, but let's not play with sin. Uh, let's not disobey God in this regard. Uh, do not kill. Uh, this is obviously a commandment. I've met many of people that say, well, I'm a good person. I've never murdered anybody. Well, I'm certainly glad when I'm talking to them and they de have declared that. At least I know that I'm not going to be murdered that day. <laughs> All right? that, that's good. Now, he also goes on, do not bear false witness. Uh, don't lie about your neighbor. Um, how many people have perjured themselves uh, under oath or just tell lies about others in their gossip when they talk about their neighbor? Uh, do not steal. Um, that's an easy one to break. Uh, many times we take things from work that don't belong to us and we appropriate others' resources for our own purposes. That's stealing. Uh, do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor thy father and thy mother. Uh, how many of a young person uh, has broken this commandment? But notice the response of this man in verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. So as far as this Pharisee, this young ruler was concerned, on a, on a peer level, human to human, He's saying, actually, I'm okay, Jesus. I have not broken those. Well, we obviously cannot love God if we don't love man. But Jesus is asking him, all right, so you want eternal life. Tell me, what do you think it takes to have a relationship with this, so that you have eternal life? So this man begins to go into the list of commandments that he has kept. I have done this. I haven't done that. Okay. So I have kept all of these commandments. Uh, here the word kept uh, is a very interesting. It just doesn't mean that he obeyed them, but rather along with his obedience, he defended the Ten Commandments as a way of life, as a principle of one's life. Now Jesus uh, will draw him back to his relationship to God, bringing his focus to those first four commandments, which govern a man's relationship with God. And uh, which are summed up in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And so while it is possible for us to have a uh, blameless relationship with people uh, in keeping the letter of the law, it is going to be impossible for us to come into God's presence and say, hey, I'm good. I've, I've loved you with all of my heart. That's our first failure is the failure to love God with all of our heart. And so Jesus was leading this young man to a confrontation uh, with his God. And so this is what the Lord Jesus uh, is going to show him, that he does not love the Lord his God with all of his heart because he has an idol of his heart. He has another love. And this is what uh, brings this young man to a realization um, that he has an idol in his heart. And what will he do? So here we see in uh, verse um, 
21, Jesus beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up thy cross and follow me. To lack, to fall short. You know, the scripture tells us for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, many of us tonight, as we're listening to the word of God, we know that we have fallen short. We have broken those man-to-man uh, -man commandments, and we have definitely broken the man-to-God commandments, and we fall short. So, you know, there are some that might be more religious than others and that might have an appearance of righteousness. Uh, one who was very courteous and thoughtful of others, but yet he wasn't right with God. Um, and, but, you know, in human terms, we might say, well, he's closer to God than maybe the addict was or the publican or the sinner or the prostitute. But yet he doesn't have a right relationship with God uh, because he's trying to earn favor with God based upon his performance of keeping the Mosaic law rather than personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he did come in the right spirit with the right question to the right person. Um, but he was unable to make a decisive right choice. So Jesus did not lower the standard for this man. The man went away sad, so close and yet so far away. Now let's look at this verse in a little bit more detail. Then Jesus beholding him loved him. Oh, what a beautiful thing to know that Jesus loves sinners. Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus love the non-elect? You're non-elect if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Does Jesus love you? Does Jesus love the non-elect? The answer to that is yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus loved him. Jesus loves all sinners and gave himself on the cross for all of mankind. He is the propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And so Jesus felt a love for him. And what a unique statement that Mark makes here. Now, notice also the invitation to become a disciple. Uh, Jesus was telling this young man, uh, not only am I telling you how you can have eternal life, but I am inviting you to become one of my disciples right now. And so the invitation has much more of a value and a higher price tag on it than the cost of giving up what really was the idol of this young man. He was genuinely enamored with Jesus in his ministry and yet in a way considered maybe himself to have something to offer to Jesus. Maybe it was his wealth, or maybe it was his education, or maybe it was his social standing as a ruler. Uh, I mean, after all, Jesus, you have unlearned and ignorant fishermen. Uh, you have tax collectors. If I were to join you, maybe you would have more of a reputable uh, opinion of, by other people if I were part of your group. Um, but the amazing thing here is that Jesus is going to uh, really tell this young man, here's what is the problem. This is the idol of your heart. This is how you have not kept the first and the great commandment of not having idols and of loving the Lord your God with all your heart. Jesus tells him, you're rich. Go sell whatever it is that you have and humble yourself and become poor and follow me. Notice the reaction of this young man here. It says here in verse 22, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. See, Jesus exposed the idol of his heart. He was trusting in his riches, and we're going to find that out here in just a moment. Um, Jesus called on him to sell everything he owned, for he had to learn that God does not need any man while every man needs God. Jesus was telling him to dispose of his property, um, and this made the young man angry. Let's look here uh, at this verse. It says, that he went away uh, sad and grieved. The idea is here that he uh, was emotionally upset, uh, but here the idea of grieved is he was angry. 
Uh, this tragedy has been repeated throughout the last 20 centuries uh, since this event where many people think that they can earn eternal life, that they can offer God something. Don't let your material possessions keep you from having eternal life. Well, we see now the sermon on the rich young man here in verse 23. So Jesus begins to give a warning and preaches a sermon about this. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? So how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? So this becomes a, an occasion for a brief discourse on the dangers of material possessions keeping you from having an eternal life relationship with God. Now, um, this young man being Jewish uh, has a cultural understanding that material blessing is an indication of a right standing with God. Uh, you can look this up in Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2, or uh, Job, the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, this was just their cultural understanding that if you were blessed materially, then God was pleased with you and you had some kind of a relationship. But you know, he knew something was missing. How can I have eternal life? And so he knew that his riches weren't enough. You know, many years ago, I was talking to a general contractor who worked in some of the elite neighborhoods um, in Contra Costa County. And as he drove into the subdivisions where millionaires lived and uh, talked with them, he just quickly learned that they were people like any other people. And uh, many of them were frustrated and angry uh, at trying to keep their money and try people trying to take it away from them. They were insecure. And so he just found out they're human. And they were not happy unless they had the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, Jesus does not condemn riches in and of themselves, but we do need to realize that they are a temptation to people, a hindrance, a diversion. Many years ago, as I was knocking on the doors in Pleasant Hill, California, uh, one young man who opened the door and I began to share with him uh, that he needed an eternal relationship with God, he began to point out all of his material possessions, a couple of cars, uh, some jet skis, uh, a boat, a nice house, a beautiful yard. And uh, he's like, looks like I'm doing okay. Doesn't look like I need God. And so definitely his wealth was keeping him from understanding his great poverty spiritually before God. And so... Um, they provide, riches provide a false security that makes radical trust in God very difficult. And so Jesus then um, points this out, that it is very difficult that those that have uh, riches to enter into the kingdom of God. This is uh, the predicament of rich people, okay? Uh, they trust in their riches to bring them security instead of God to bring them righteousness. Now, he says here in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So there's great difficulty here. Uh, the illustration uh, would be readily understood by the disciples uh, with a city gate that was a, a large door, then uh, being closed at night, and then just a, a smaller door open for civilian traffic that uh, once it's barred, then it would be impossible to enter the city. So this is a smaller door. And you can imagine a, a trader or a caravan coming up um, that is loaded with uh, the wealth on the backs of the camels. And as they approach the, the city gate, the main gate is closed and uh, only the uh, walk-in gate is left. And so the animal in no way is going to be able to get through that gate. The camel with its load would be too big to get through even the smaller door with inside the city gate. Um, and so this is what is referred to as the eye of a needle. The owner of the camel then would have to divest the camel of its burden before there was any hope of squeezing through the small opening. So here's the point. Jesus is telling us that those who trust in riches, this is their predicament. To gain access to the kingdom of God through the straight or the narrow gate <clears throat> of which Jesus spoke, he must unload or divest himself of what is hindering him from getting into the kingdom of God. And that is, he has to divest himself of his trust in riches. 
and learn to put his trust in God alone. Wealthy humans tend to trust in their own resources instead of God. Do not let your material possessions keep you from eternal life. Our fifth point tonight then is the surprise of the disciples. Look with me at verse 24 and 26. It says, And the disciples were astonished at his word, verse 26, and they were astonished out of measure. Uh, this is a favorite expression of uh, Mark as he's uh, going through his gospel, um, talking about the amazement, the astonishment of people uh, and their reaction to what Jesus Christ is doing, his understanding, his teaching, his miracles, his power, uh, and now clearly uh, his teaching on uh, what would keep one from having eternal life. And so they're, what it means to be astonished is that they're outside of themselves, almost looking back down upon themselves in wonderment, uh, amazement. Uh, this is so unreal. How, how can this uh, possibly be? And so the notion that prosperity uh, was equated with godliness was deeply ingrained in Jewish culture. And so they were stunned. They were amazed at what Jesus was teaching. Uh, Jesus has a blunt denial that this is truly what God meant in those passages that we referred to in Job and in the Psalms. Um, and so, uh, you know, this false concept even persists today. And I'm going to be radical and make a comment here. There is a movement, a, a subsection of Christianity that is called the prosperity gospel. Uh, many years ago, there was a charismatic Pentecostal pastor that uh, asked me to come to a family event of his and to say a prayer for uh, his infant daughter that they wanted to dedicate to the Lord. And so I went and I noticed that he had an, an older Mercedes Benz. I mean, it was probably 15 or 20 years old, but it was still in really nice condition. So I made some kind of comment about it and his response to me was, well, God wants you to have nice things. It's part of his blessing. Um, and so can you see how this way of thinking is still deeply ingrained in the religious mindset of evangelical Christians in our country today. Uh, we think that God is our cosmic bellboy, that we pray uh, a prayer and ring a bell, God make me wealthy, and God's going to do that. Or if I perform well enough for God, then he will reward me with material blessing. And this is the mindset that must be corrected today especially amongst those that hold to the prosperity gospel. So multitudes believe that they're offered wealth and health along with long life and happiness as the birthright of belief. The whole history of the church uh, in a hostile world puts a lie to such fanciful ideas. But now Jesus calls his disciples children. Uh, notice uh, with me here um, that this is just another indication in here in the text, in our passage about children, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, these children, you must have the faith of a child. Further verification in that context that a child or a disciple of Jesus is one who has childlike faith, that just simple dependence upon God. Now, as we go through this, we see the astonishment or the surprise of the disciples. And so Peter was sure that he and the other disciples would receive a reward for doing what the rich young ruler had not done. God does reward faithfulness, but our motive should be love for Christ, not a desire for gain. Uh, there was an industrialist many years ago by the name of R.G. Letourneau. He owned Caterpillar, a uh, heavy earth moving equipment company. And uh, he became a very wealthy man, but he failed many times in business. Um, but as he became a billionaire and began to give away more and more of his wealth, he said this, if you give because it pays, it won't pay. And so we cannot uh, enter into Christian service with this idea that God is going to reward us materially because of our service. Now, notice with me verse 27, And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So there is God's grace. Rich people can be saved because of God's grace. And so it's such a, a welcome uh, balance to a, a radical uh, nature of discipleship. Humans are unable to approach a holy God, but the wonderful, amazing truth is 
that God approaches us. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you'll go down to verse uh, 45, you'll see that. And to be a servant and to ransom his, uh, become a ransom for us all. And so uh, this might be an illusion, the statement that with God all things are possible. Uh, to the Old Testament account with Abraham, when Abraham uh, was childless and wondered if that was really true, if God could do that. And God assured uh, Abraham that nothing was impossible. And of course, Jesus says in the New Testament, uh, with God, nothing is impossible. Hey, listen, that's a wonderful thing. Never take God out of the equation in your life when you're encountering a difficulty or a hardship because God can do it. Now, we've got a couple of points left here in tonight's message. Let's look at verses 28 and 29. Let's look at the surrender then of the disciples, the surrender of the disciples. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Um, what a wonderful thing to surrender yourself to the Lord for the gospel's sake. Now, the gospel is a wonderful thing. Many years ago, as I was uh, preaching the good news, the gospel in a care facility, uh, an elderly lady rolled into the activities room. Uh, as she was passing by, she recognized what I was saying was the gospel. And as she rolled into the room, she just blurted out loud, I haven't heard the gospel in years. Well, praise God, she recognized and identified the preciousness of the gospel. But what a beautiful thing it is to give your life over as a Christian to preaching the gospel. Hey, listen, California right now needs hope of the gospel. Uh, we're on fire, literally, as a state. People are dying and going into eternity, literally. Uh, we need to be sharing the gospel. People are dying of the virus. We need to share the gospel. Uh, people are dying because of their prosperity. We need to share the gospel. We need to trust that God can save human beings. But here the disciples are saying, look, we have given our lives over to you, Jesus. We've, we've left behind what we have considered a value. And uh, we're doing this for you and for the gospel's sake. And so they were surrendered this, all right? So one's priority and commitment to Jesus must even supersede that of family uh, because they're leaving siblings, they're leaving spouses, they're leaving parents. Um, now, not divorcing spouses, um, but they're lessening those human relationships so that they can have a mission for Christ and his gospel. And so uh, here is, this is one's ultimate allegiance. This is our priority in life. Now, notice with me uh, a couple of things in, in these verses, okay? Uh, the conjunctions and and the word or, okay? So, um, verse 28, and have followed thee. Uh, verse 29, uh, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the Gospels. The and and the ors, why are they there? Okay. Every word of the Bible is breathed by God, is inspired. And so what is being pointed out here is the individual sacrifice of each one of these comments, each one of these things, that God is taking note of that sacrifice. Um, and it is given up for his sake and for the gospel's sake and to show that he has a sharp eye out. He keeps each surrender to ensure a subsequent reward. Now, let's look in closing here tonight at verses 30 and 31 at the salvation of the disciples. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Now, notice these phrases now in this time. And then it goes on to say, um, and in the world to come eternal life. Uh, listen, I'm glad that there is a newer age that is going to come. 
I'm ready and willing for the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to set up his kingdom. I am ready and willing for this particular age to end. Uh, and it's not as bad as it's going to get. And so there is a hope that is put before them of an age to come. That is what we call a, a messianic age, a, a time of great prosperity for Israel. But notice that there is a quality of life now. Jesus says uh, here, but shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. And so, you know, eternal life is a quality of life now, as well as a time concept for the future. But eternal life with God now is a life in which God does bless us. Now, not materially, okay? And that may not be true for every Christian. But notice that uh, the joy that we can find in the family of God and entering into God's kingdom is that we are, are blessed with relationships. Let me just challenge those that attend Calvary Baptist Church and challenge you as a Christian. You need to be involved and actually show up even during a pandemic. I mean, if you don't have an underlying health issue, then, then show up. Uh, don't let this keep you away. Don't let this drive you away from the blessings which God has for you. Those relationships that are mentioned here are your blessings. Um, you need a brother. You need a sister. You need a spiritual parent. God's family can provide that. Um, you know, I was just... Um, here in verse 30, it says in houses, uh, one of the, the families here in our church uh, owns a beautiful home uh, in the Lake Tahoe region. And they uh, were willing to share that uh, with my family this last week. And what a blessing it is to receive these things uh, because we're part of the family of God, the kingdom of God. And so there is a quality of life now uh, in the love and the joy and the peace that one has as well as the relationships and possibly some material benefit. And so this is a quality of life now, that eternal life that we can have right now. And so rather Jesus um, was just saying that Christians will be amply compensated uh, in the new age for what they give up in their former life. But let me just ask you this. I mean, are we serving God for the blessings of material possessions. I mean, if we've entered into a reward for service, then what need is there for grace? Why would we have grace? Uh, material possessions are not the experiences of all godly believers, but the joy and the abundance of the larger Christian family. Uh, these are the experiences of this. Now, to temper the mentality um, that material wealth is a sign of God's blessing in your life. Notice what Jesus says here uh, that we will receive also in this lifetime. Words that we don't like to hear. With persecutions. What a shocking inclusion. Uh, Mark shocks us. It's unique to him. Christians are going to be persecuted in this fallen age. Now, I think we need to be careful not to have a self-fulfilling prophecy and think that we're being persecuted when we're not. Uh, we need to be very careful of that. But there is, Jesus says, persecution in this life. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer tribulation, persecution. And so this persecution serves uh, three purposes. Number one, evidence is that we are saved. Number two, God's means of molding us into Christ likeness. And number three, proof that the world will be judged. But now let's look not only at the salvation of the disciples in this life, let's look at uh, letter B then, a quality and quantity of life in the future or then. But there's more. All of this and eternal life too. From the New Testament, it is obvious that there is a new age coming, the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, began to us establish that kingdom. He went around preaching that kingdom. But yet it has not been fully consummated. So there is a day in which the kingdom will be set up. Now, I believe in an earthly kingdom. I don't apologize for that. I can defend that from Scripture. And what a joy it is for Israel to know that God is not done with them yet. 
and that we as Gentiles were grafted into Israel, not Israel into us. The church has not replaced Israel. The church is blessed because of a future for Israel. And this is where the blessing is to be found in this future age. And so there is uh, another coming of the Messiah. There is his second coming. In the first coming, he came as a suffering servant, Isaiah 53, that through his stripes we are healed. We're not healed through Israel's sufferings. Um, he was wounded for our transgressions. We're not saved because Israel has suffered. We're saved because Jesus Christ has suffered. And so he is going to come again, according to Revelation 19, a second time as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we are blessed as followers of Christ um, by being able to participate in both uh, epics or time periods. And so notice what the rich young ruler was after was eternal life. So Jesus says, and in the world to come, eternal life. What a beautiful thing to know. Here's how you can know that you have eternal life. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has life, but he that does not have the son does not have life. So do you have the son of God tonight? How do you receive the Son of God? How do you have possession of Him? Well, the Bible says, for, uh, In the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's that childlike humility, uh, humility, that childlike faith and trust in God the Father as a parent, that He's provided a way for us to have a, an eternal relationship with Him through the gift of His Son on the cross. Jesus Christ, the righteous, died for us, the unrighteous. Jesus Christ, the just, died for us, the unjust. That he might reconcile us, bring us to God, bring us to God's standard through his work on the cross and putting faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. So tonight, will you acknowledge that you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself? Your riches cannot save you. Your religious uh, observance of the Ten Commandments cannot save you. So how do you then have eternal life? By inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life through repentance and faith. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can have that eternal life tonight and you can know the assurance of that. Uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So tonight as we close our proposition, the servant of humanity, teaches us that material possessions can keep us from having eternal life and truly be blessed in service if they, we make material uh, possessions the point of service. So tonight, don't let material possessions keep you from eternal life and don't let them rob you. Uh, that motivation for material possessions rob you of the rewards of Christian service. God keeps track. He is not unfaithful, but God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards the saints and uh, toward him and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So God will reward us. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer tonight. Father, thank you for the sermon on the rich young ruler. Help us not to let material possessions keep us out of heaven. Help us not to trust in those things as a means of security in, in, in age to come. Help us to realize that there is an age to come and a life which we must be prepared for. Help those that are hearing uh, this message tonight, even being replayed later, to come to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to serve you, uh, knowing that each sacrifice we make, you're taking note of it. Lord, we don't serve you to be blessed. Lord, we serve you uh, to bless your name and to love you. And so, Lord, help that to be our motivation tonight. We ask this now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.